Hello everyone, my name is Adi, I'm with Disguise, and today I'm going to be presenting to you the upcoming trends in virtual production. So with that said, let's get started. Disguise is a platform that is uh, both hardware and software, and Disguise powers many stages around the world, including this stage right here at uh, the Hong Kong Film Art, and of course, Devotion Virtual Production Studio. Disguise is made up of servers, so here I have the picture of our flagship server, the VX4, which powers full 4K outputs. And these robust, reliable competing platforms power our software, which is called Designer. And together with those two, in general, a virtual production studio can be powered by many types of LED panels, many types of processors, camera tracking technology, and underneath all of it is the Disguise platform that is powering it. And if we get into a little bit more detail, when it comes to 2D and 2.5D playback, so if you're looking at driving plates and things like that, generally you would use our VX server connected to a volume. And if you are doing Unreal Engine content, then you have the VX4 servers with the RX servers. And together they work together through a protocol called RenderStream. And that is what powers virtual production for Unreal Engine. This is how we're running this booth right now. And I want to take a step back and really get into the fact that virtual production is just the tool for the studios. And how they perceive it is how virtual production is being utilized. Now, you have to realize virtual production is a very expensive tool, but it's also a tool that could save you a lot of money. So every minute on a virtual production set, because there are numerous people involved, a lot of technologies involved, you're literally burning hundreds of dollars per second on the largest of shoots. And because of that, every second counts. And because of that, you can't have any downtime or really have a really reliable system like Disguise or Brompton or Aoto. In this case, you want to let the creatives do their work without having any technical disruptions. Now, the last three years reflecting on virtual production, I think it's safe to say that we've matured quite a bit as an industry and we've come a long way. And for the most part, Virtual production is ready and is being utilized by many, many films all around the world. And that is because of what we call virtual production 1.0. So right now, there are certain use cases where virtual production is absolutely the go-to for that kind of work. For example, any kind of car process work where you have actors inside of a car that is most of the time done inside of a stage now. If you look at all of the movies, let's say like Barbie or, Op Barbie or Fast and Furious or Bullet Train, these shows have all used disguise for car process. And this is one of those killer use cases that gets the studios more comfortable with virtual production. And at, as virtual production is adopted more and more over time, the creatives and really the management team, people like producers, production executives, are becoming more comfortable with this technology. And it's no longer experimental. It's actually a, becoming more of a core part of things like car process. So that is what I would say virtual production 1.0. Over the last three years from 2020 to about six to 10 months ago is the inception of our industry. And it all has to do with a very big show that was very successful and it really helped showcase this technology in the best positive light, and that is The Mandalorian. So The Mandalorian is, in a lot of ways, the symbol of virtual production 1.0. At the time, we were still in a pandemic and travel was difficult and you needed to create a beautiful sci-fi environment put reflective suits and reflective actors in that environment, and the Mandalorian was the perfect vehicle for such a show. So the holdback with Virtual Production 1.0 was, even though it created a wonderful show, it was still quite expensive. And for a big studio like Disney and ILM 
and Lucasfilm, they can afford to do a show like The Mandalorian, but what about the rest of us? And although there were a successful season after season execution, the technology itself needed a lot of hand-holding. The Mandalorian team had tens and dozens of engineers behind this console making sure that stage worked. And that is 1.0. Three years ago, because it was new, it was still a science project. That's what was needed. So customization and cost and complexity was really in the way. And finally, fast forward to today, after the strikes in Hollywood, we are sort of transitioning away from 1.0 and what I call going into 2.0. The industry still wants to use virtual production for a lot of things. However, things have to be streamlined. Things have to be more cost efficient. And for that, I want to show you some of the trends that are helping us transition into virtual production 2.0. Virtual production 2.0 is an evolution, not a revolution of VP 1.0. So in general, we qualify stages by the canvas size. That's the number of pixels that you have on a given LED wall. For example, this LED wall is in the sort of small range because we're at a trade show. Now there's stages that are really, really large and they have 32 4K outputs and so on. So we are seeing actually a lot of growth in the medium sized stages. The world just needs more of them, and we see a lot more transaction in that size. Where we're seeing a slowdown is in the extra large and maybe even some of the large stages. Because the most expensive productions can only afford to utilize those, the world doesn't really need that many of them. However, there are just tons more small and medium and even on the smaller large stages that the world needs. So. If you could imagine a pyramid, the bottom half of the pyramid is where all of the growth will be coming from in VP 2.0. And at the same time, while you're building a stage, you're not committing to the shape and the size of it. The stages have to be flexible and modular. Well, what does that mean? It means if you have to change the curve to a flat wall, or if you have to add a floor, or you have to delete the ceiling, or if you have to add more tiles and make it a horseshoe shape. You can do these things very, very quickly with the technology today that probably wasn't quite as ready three, four years ago. LED tiles, LED processor, media servers, all of these things are evolving to become more flexible and modular. Modularity is really important because you can take a large stage, split it into two different stages, and then effectively have two different shoots. This really enhances the return on investment for studios looking to buy all of this hardware and then utilize that to make productions. And the other trend that we're seeing is pop-ups. How we define pop-ups is a temporary stage for a temporary production. For example, if there was a film shoot somewhere in Atlanta and it was only needed for two weeks, the ability for a company to ship LED panels, media servers, technicians to that location for a couple of weeks, build a stage, complete the shoot, and then ship it all back. We're seeing a lot more of pop-ups than previous. That is because crews don't want to travel to the nearest virtual production stage. They want the stage to come to them. And production itself is evolving at the same time. So while virtual production, the technology is evolving, the studios and how they're behaving and how they are adjusting to this new tool set is also changing. Let me show you. So this is a, what I would call a legacy flowchart. So for the last hundred years, this is more or less how films have been made. You have a pre-production process, which is generally very minimal. And then you have your principal photography process, which is what you and I would call a shoot. And all of the shooting happens, whether it's on location, on a green screen, or in a virtual production set. And then finally, when you have captured all of that, you have an extensive post-production process. So this could be six months, this could be one year, but this is where ma the majority of the money is spent and the majority of the time is spent because 
That is how you get to script blocks and iterations and changes and reshoots. So for the last 100 years, this is more or less how films have been made. Now, during VP 1.0, we initially asked studios to change that paradigm a little bit. We asked them to make more commitments up front, invest in more creative decision making, lock the script, figure out your creative, and then when you go into principal photography, it's more streamlined. And finally, the cost saving is when you come out of it at the end, there is less need for reshoots, less need for visual effects, and that is the true savings of virtual production. Not only would it be slightly cheaper, but more importantly, it'll be faster. And this is why you see shows like The Mandalorian have multiple seasons within a single year repeatedly because they're able to cut back on the post-production side. For VP 2.0, what is actually happening is we're seeing a trend where the VFX department and the virtual production department are working together before the show and even after the show. So during pre-production, the VFX team is working very closely with the virtual production team to build assets, to make sure those assets are gonna be of the same quality and the same caliber as those used in post. And after the shoot, the VFX team has the continuity and knows exactly where those assets are. So this, I think, is more VP 2.0. Now, this also helps the studios not make creative commitments up front, so they're not really changing the entire paradigm of how they make content. At the same time, while the hardware technology and all the stage components are getting better, the actual content and how you generate that content is getting better as well. With Unreal 5.4 coming out, real-time rendering is getting better really, really fast. We have easier way to achieve photorealism, the simulations are getting better, and of course, just world building in general is slightly easier than it was two, three years ago. So as real-time rendering gets better, we're gonna need more compute power and push higher photorealistic seats. There's a new trend called 2.5D. If you are not familiar with it, Imagine layering images and videos one on top of each other for creating parallax. This is an easy way for virtual production creatives to achieve the look of 3D with parallax without the cost and complexity of 3D. It's much easier to create things in 2.5D and have parallax rather than build an entire world in 3D. However, sometimes you absolutely must need to build a world in Unreal Engine for creative needs. In most cases, that is what it needs to happen. In some cases, if you just need to capture the real world, then 2.5D is a perfect use case. And of course, 2D plates and driving plates, the backbone of virtual production continues to be strong. We have Vendors like drivingplates.com, Plateplos, Brownian, these vendors are building car plates with higher and higher quality that is more and more usable. Their technology is evolving at the same time our technology is evolving. So car process is something that is still very, very popular. I would say more than half of the shoots all over the world that's using an LED volume is using car process and their libraries are growing every day, which means if you need a car process plate, the chances are they've already captured it rather than ha having be a custom job. Finally, AI and how AI uses an input is a major trend, and I see that becoming more and more useful. For example, if you're building a Nerf with a technology like Volinga, you can input driving plates into that technology and create 3D realistic parallax without creating the world in Unreal Engine. So these shortcuts and these efficiency hacks is the key to VB 2.0 and how we create content even faster and cheaper. The mindset that 
you need to have in this new gener in this new era of virtual production is the right tool for the right shot. So if your shot requires full customization, that shot is Unreal Engine. If your shot is just a scenic beach or a sky or a mountain, it's probably easier to capture a plate or build a two and a half D plate and go from there. So you can have a multi-prong approach and this is something we call content flexibility. And finally, the producers and the creatives adapting to the right tool for the shot approach. I think the virtual art department is streamlining and realizing there is more tools to the tool shed than just real-time rendering. And we're seeing a lot more usage in 2D plates, 2.5D, and even some experimentation with generative AI like Kubrick and neuron radiant fields and Gaussian splats. So all of these things all contribute to what we call content flexibility. So in summary, VP 2.0 is all about flexibility. It's not setting a workflow in stone. It's about having options. It's about creating things as it's needed rather than creating very, very large thing that may not be needed in post, staying lean, and also allowing room for changes and iterations and flexibility, which is what every production wants. Okay, and that is the end of my presentation. Thank you.